Okay, I think if we should, uh, we should make a start. Uh, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Peter Bruce. I'm the physical secretary of the Royal Society and one of the vice presidents. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to Carlton House Terrace, the home of the Royal Society, and to this Bakerian Award uh, lecture. Uh, now, uh, let me just say a little bit about the Bakerian Medal and Lecture. It's one of our premier um, lectures. It is the premier uh, lecture and medal in the physical sciences. It was established through a bequest of Henry Baker, who was a fellow of the Royal Society, uh, who made a bequest of £100, and I shall read you uh, the, um, the, the, the remit, if you like, for the, uh, for the Bakerian, as written at that time. Uh, for a narration or discourse on such part of natural history or experimental philosophy at such time and in such manner as the president and the council of the society for the time being shall please to order and appoint. Now you gather that it's not a rel relatively recently introduced um, lecture and medal, um, the origin 1775. So it's been around for quite some time. And the medal as well as the medal, uh, it's accompanied by a gift of 10,000 pounds. Now, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce uh, the medal winner and our lecture, lecturer this evening, Andrew uh, Zimmerman. Uh, Andrew is one of the principal architects of modern computer vision. Uh, his work in the 1980s on surface reconstruction and discontinuities is widely cited. He is the best known, best known for his leading work in the 1990s, establishing the computational theory of multiple view reconstruction and the development of practical algorithms that are widely used today. This culminated in the publication of a book in 20, was at 2000, turn of the century in other words, with Richard Hartley, already regarded now as a standard text. His laboratory in Oxford is internationally renowned and its work is currently shedding new light on the problems of objective detection, object detection and recognition. So without any further ado, you want to hear from him, I'm sure, not me. Let me welcome Andrew to the stage to present his lecture, as you see the title there, Computer Vision, Learning to See the World. Andrew. Okay, good. Thank you, um for the introduction, Peter, and, and uh, thank you for the prize. It's a, it's a great honour for me. It's a great honour for the computer vision field as well. So we're very grateful. So I'm going to talk on computer vision, learning to see the world, and uh, I'm going to start off by saying what computer vision is. So here, this, the aim of computer vision is to extract visual information from images and videos so that the computer can understand images and, and videos much like a human would understand them. That's what we aim to do. So in this um, image here, we'd like to be able to answer questions like what is in the image, so the objects, in this case a person that's in the image, where are the things in the image, um, meaning the, the spatial layout of the scene, um, the pose of the person, um, and then what is happening. Nothing's much happening at the moment, but if I play the video, it's a bit more interesting. <laughs> A, a clip from Singing in the Rain. Okay, so as I say, our, our, the objective is to be able to carry out tasks like this, answer these questions. And the field has, has made quite some progress. And we can do quite a few things now, since, especially since the advent of deep learning about a decade ago. So I'll show you some examples. And the first one is, I'm going to show you um, a video sequence in the top left, and then various views of the 3D layout of the people and what they're doing as they, they sort of collide with each other. So that's sort of the where task. The next one I'm going to show you is, is the what task. So here you're seeing object detection and tracking. So the, these boxes are detecting the objects, they're moving through the video that's tracking it, and there's also recognition going on. The, the, maybe you can read the labels, but it's recognising the, the various animals and uh, objects. So, as a tiger, it recognises it as a tiger, deer, um, also some uh, vehicles you'll see in a moment. 
is the metabolic link. So all of these being recognized um, directly in the image and then tracked. Um, and that was sort of what is in the image, what is the video. And the next one I want to show you is action. So we can recognize human actions now. Um, and we can also recognize actions of humans and other animals. And I'm going to show you an animal example. So here, this is what you're going to see is uh, chimpanzees. And this is how computer vision can support other fields. So um, zoologists have hundreds of hours of videos that they want to analyze and annotate. And with computer vision, you can annotate the actions or the behavior of chimpanzees automatically all through the video. So here you're going to see the behaviors of nutcracking and eating. Okay, now each of these tasks I've shown you, sort of recognition tasks the, of actions or what's in the image, has been done by a, a deep learning model. And a deep learning model for a visual task is trained in three steps. Okay. Uh, first step is you construct a very, very large data set of images or videos that you label for the task you want, like recognizing an image. Then you choose or you design a, a deep model. This is where the deep part comes, a, a neural network. And third step is to train the model's parameters on this data set. You train it by predicting the labels that are on the data set. Okay. And I'll show you an example. So for the recognition I was showing you earlier, recognizing the animals and the vehicles, we were using a, a network um, which had been trained to classify a thousand different object categories. Um, and this is a picture of the network. So it takes in an image, in this case an elephant, and then the output is a choice of one of the thousand categories that's been trained to recognize. And this network um, has 30 million parameters. That's a lot of parameters. And so to train it, you need a very large data set. And it was trained on a data set of a million images, a thousand images for each of the thousand categories. Okay. What that means is that somebody had to find a thousand images of monkeys um, like this, uh, some, a thousand images of dogs, a thousand images of elephants, colossal amount of work. And that's what the network was trained on. Now, I'm going to the, per the sort of where the core of this lecture. This is not how a, a baby learns to see. So a baby is not shown a thousand images and said, this is a dog, a thousand images, this is a cat. That's not how a baby learns to see. And what I want, I'm going to do in this lecture is explore how computers can learn to see more in a way that a, an infant learns to see, and that is to learn directly from the data. That's what I'm going to show. So what this means is we have these three steps for learning a visual task. And we're going to throw away the first step. We're not going to have a large data set that somebody has to construct. Instead, we're going to obtain the supervision to train the network directly from the data. Okay. Now, this is not a new idea. So Turing, in 1950, wrote a paper. And he said, instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulates a child? If this were then subject to an appropriate course of education, one would attain the adult brain. Okay, so just following what Turing suggested in 1950. It also ties in with what's been found by psychologists who study cognitive development in infants. And what they found is the importance of data in, in order to develop um, intelligence. There's data from the physical world is needed. Okay. And this paper, which is very good to read, gives six lessons in order to develop intelligence in uh, children, and therefore us. And lesson number one is be multimodal. And so I'm going to be multimodal. So for the next part, the, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show how machines can learn directly from the data without having to have a, a labeled data set. And I'm going to particularly pick out the theme of correspondence between modalities. And that's what we're going to learn from. And I'm going to show three different examples. This, this, this method of learning from the data is called self-supervision. And the first one I'm going to do, the modalities will be audio and visual, and I'm going to learn from the correspondence of those. OK, example number one. So here's an example, first of all, of what a synchronized signal is. So this is, this is of course, what, what we have in the world. We have these synchronized um, signals coming in. The audio and visual is signal, synchronized. Um, we can, of course, make them unsynchronized by shifting the audio. And then it sounds like this. Okay. 
And it, just this difference that we get this, this synchronized signal for three, we can also make it unsynchronized. That's going to be the supervision we're going to use to train the network. And I'm going to illustrate this with talking heads. Okay? And the reason I'm doing talking heads, well, two reasons. One, if we think of the um, Turing baby, what is the baby going to see first? It's going to, be, it's going to see its parents speaking. So in terms of, that's, that's one reason. The second is, we as humans are very, very sensitive to lack of synchronization in talking heads. I'll show you an example. I was in the camps yesterday talking to people. There are 1.3 million earthquake survivors still living in those crowded camps. So I hope you can see that that was, that was out of sync. Well, here, it's out of sync, very nice. And so now to how we're going to train the network. We're going to, we're going to uh, train it to tell if the lip motion in a video sequence is synchronized um, with the audio or not. So that will be its task. We're going to give it a, a, a video sequence, a video clip, and the audio, and say, are these synchronized? And that's going to be the training signal. The network itself is going to um, be, have a part which takes in a video clip, and the, this network's going to be called a visual encoder, takes in the, the video clip and produces a vector. We're also going to have an audio encoder that takes in an audio clip, produces a vector. These vectors, these are lists of numbers, maybe 512 numbers, um, but you can think of it just as a point in 3D. And so the visual encoder predicts a point, the audio encoder predicts a point, and then the training is going to be that if the audio and the visual is synchronized, we want these points to be close together, and if the audio and visual are not synchronized, we want them to be far apart. So it's very, very simple. Where do we get the data from? We get it from just natural signals coming in. So we have um, some frames and the corresponding video, sorry, corresponding audio. That will be synchronized. We'll call that a positive sample. We can get any number of positive samples from videos of talking heads. And now if we take the frames and displace, take a, a temporal displacement, the audio and visual will no longer be synchronized. So that will be what we'll call a negative sample. Okay, so we can generate these positive negative samples effortlessly from any video coming in of a talking head. And we can get millions of these. So that will be our training data. So now we take this, this network, which has a visual encoder producing a, a vector, audio encoder producing a vector, and train it on all these samples, which we know are synchronized or not synchronized because we're creating them. And we train it so that if, the, if it can tell, if, the, if it's synchronized, the points it produces are close, and if they're not synchronized, they're not close. Okay. Now imagine we've done that and trained this on millions of examples. What we will end up with is um, points which are close together when it's synchronized. So what I'm showing here is called an embedding space. This is where the, these vectors we've produced live. So that's, this is, I'm showing it in 2D. So when, um, when we have that synchronized signal, then the, the points that are produced, the vectors that are produced by the video encoder and the audio encoder are close, like this. They're not synchronized, then they won't be close. Okay? That's what we've learned. We've told it to do this. We've, we've trained it. It's done that. So now I'm going to show you, once we've done this, what can we use it for? And the first thing we can use it for is to synchronize audio and visual, when it's, audio and visual signals when they're not synchronized. Okay, so the way this works is we, um, we know that when they're not synchronized, the audio and visual embeddings are going to be distant. We can then shift the audio, and as, if we shift it and they become close, then they'll be synchronized. So we start with something that's unsynchronized, um, shift the audio, these, until these vectors become close, then it will be synchronized. And what that means we can do is we, we have this annoying example of out of sync. We can now synchronize that to this. Of heavy rain and probably four or five hours of heavy rain ahead. I was in the camps yesterday talking to people. There are 1.3 million earthquake survivors. Okay. But more importantly, we can also use this, this network that we've trained to find out where, where in the image or the video the person speaking is. Okay? And this is a, the way, way this is going to be shown is we're going to have a, a, a video and an audio track, and we're going to produce what's called a heat map, where, where it's hottest where it is where the person's speaking. Okay? That's, we're going to use this for, for localization. Okay, now this is a bit more technical, but the way this works is inside the network, we have to go into the network a bit, there's a spatial grid of vectors, and these, this spatial grid of vectors corresponds to the spatial grid of the pixels. And we can take the audio encoding vector and we can pick out the vector in the spatial grid 
which is closest. And the one which is closest will be the one which is most synchronized, and that will be where the speaker is. Okay? So just go inside the network a bit. So now I'll show you some examples. Uh, on the left, you'll see the heat map, and on the right, you'll see a box around where the speaker is. It's the perfect place to come if you want to see old roses looking their absolute best and the very latest is about to take place. And here's another clue. If you come by private... So the next thing we can do, that's just one example, where we could track somebody using their voice. Now, I'm going to show that we've got multiple people speaking um, on and off, and maybe some people are moving their lips, but they're not speaking because they're yawning or laughing. Um, we can pick out the active speaker by this signal because we can, we can find the pixels, if you like, which are synchronized with the voice we're hearing. By private concerns uh, on U.S. relations with those countries, and also FOIA, uh, freedom of information request. It's Tell me if you think it's okay. And finally, we're not tied to humans. We, we've, we've trained a network. We have ways of training networks which can pick out synchronized signals. So this can equally work to uh, for cartoons where the the mouth moves with the the voice. It will work with that as well. So again, what you're going to see. I didn't, so before, but the blue will be the active speaker and the red will be the inactive speaker. Hey, Dad, you said you were going to play catch with me tonight. Well, I have to work, but give the monitor a kiss. Okay. So that's the end of the first example. What you've seen is we can, we can take something which arises from the world, the physics of the world, which is synchronization, and then manipulate it slightly, train this network which has tens or hundreds of millions of parameters, and then use this network to um, track person who's speaking, for example. Um, so I'm going to go on to the, the second example, which is audio-visual correspondence beyond just talking heads. So now we're going to consider more general objects, more general scenarios, where we have um, various objects that make sounds or actions that make sounds. Um, and in terms of this Turing infant, we imagine that you know, it's, it's, it's been watching its parents talking, now it's sitting up, it's looking around at the world and, and looking and listening to objects um, around it. Okay. So this is development. Right, so the idea here is, if you see an image like this, this is an image of a drums, you know what it's gonna sound like. Okay. And if you hear a sound like this, oops, give away. If you hear a sound like this, You know the answer. So obviously this is a guitar. So you have this semantic correspondence between what's in, in the image and the sound. And this, this arises just again from the physical world. That uh, in the physical world, you look at the scene, if something's sounding, you can see it and you can hear it. So this, again, just arises from the physics of the world. Um, and we're going to use this correspondence, semantic correspondence between the, uh, the vision and the, um, the audio to learn from, to train the network. Just to, to note, this is a weaker requirement of synchronization. We can do it from a single image. We don't actually need temporal information for this. We need the audio signal and, and uh, an image. Okay, so the way to do it, it I, I'm going to formulate it like as a picking game. We're going to task the network to uh, pick which of these images um, this sound corresponds to. Okay. So uh, imagine the sound is actually a guitar and um, it, it has to pick out which of these it corresponds to and it should pick this one. And the way we're going to do this is again distances. We're going to find which of, of uh, these embeddings, open embeddings, has the smallest distance and pick that one. So we'll have a, a similar network we're going to train as before. We're taking a video clip, it goes through a visual encoder, produces a vector list of numbers. We take an audio clip, it goes through an audio encoder, produces a vector, and what we want is if the audio and visual correspond, then the distance between these vectors is small, these, three, these points are small. If, the, uh, if they don't correspond, then the point, distance between the points should be large, and that's it. So where do we get the data from? Well, we get the data from any videos we have. So here's two videos. Um, we don't need to know what's in them. In the top but they, they differ in this case. Uh, what we do know is that the, there's a correspondence between the sound and 
the frames. So now we can take samples from this for training. So we can take positive samples where we take a, a frame and the audio around it. We can take any number of these. Now, how do we get negative samples? We simply take the audio from one video and a frame from another video. And in general, they won't correspond, and that's it. And we can sample, we can do this, we just, we have videos which arise from the world, have this, this correspondence property naturally, and we can sample millions um, of positive and negative samples like this and train this network. Okay, so that's it. So again, imagine we've done this, and we'll look at this embedding space where these vectors live, then what we'll have learned is when the audio and visual correspond, the embeddings will be close together. Um, and now if we have maybe another instrument like a drum, then um, the sound um, will, will be distant from the embedding for the, from the guitar, but it will be close to the embedding of the, of the image of the drum. Okay? So we have an embedding space that we've learned like this. Now, what can we do with this? Um, oh, I'm gonna, one thing we can do is what's called cross-modal retrieval. We can start with a sound, and now we can find images which correspond to this sound. And the way to do this is to populate um, the joint embedding space with frames from videos. So that's what I'm showing here. The, all of these points are frames from videos. And now we can look at na the neighbourhood of where the sound's been embedded and pick frames which are close by, and they must be corresponding. So I'll show an example. Here's a sound I'm going to play you. Now, what, what is producing that sound? We, we can dive into this embedding space, look at nearby frames, and find videos. And here are the videos that could have made that sound. So it's, it's cross-modal. We start with audio, and we find images. Now I'm going to show another use of this embedding space. So you, we've seen that we trained it so that the, it, when there's a correspondence between the audio and visual, that the embedding vectors are close. So imagine here we have the sound of a guitar. Um, then any other um, image of a guitar should be embedded close by to this, okay, because that's what we've trained it to do. Um, and so by transitivity, what, what's happened with this network is it's learned to embed all of the objects of the same class near, near together. That's what it has to learn to do. And this is, in fact, how it solves the problem. How else could it solve the problem of determining the correspondence between the audio and visual unless it was doing this? So we've actually learned a network that, the visual network, which learns to embed objects of the same class close together. And now we can use this for visual retrieval. So we can start off with a, a frame of a video, put it into the embedding space, populate this with other videos, and now look at the neighbours of this, and these will be other videos. So we can start with a video, search for similar videos, or start with frames, search for similar frames. So here's an example. We start with a, a frame of a, a guitar, search in um, a few hundred thousand images, and these are the ones that are nearby. So you see, we start from acoustic guitar, it found acoustic guitars. Another query, we start with a drum, search inside this embedding space, we can find images of drums. Okay. And that's all been... The point is, all this has been learned simply from uh, taking samples from videos where the audio and visual correspond. So that's all we had to do. We've trained this visual network, and now we can use this visual network, network for recognition. Okay, and we can also use it for localization. So it, as we saw in the synchronization case, we go inside the network. The network has this spatial grid of vectors. To find out where the, the object is that's making the sound, we take the audio embedding, we look at the spatial grid of vectors, find the closest vector, and that will be where the object is that's making the sound. So I'm going to show you an example now. You're going to see a video, and frame by frame, um, you're going to see the um, heat map in the centre and overlaid on the, on the frame, and then on the right, you'll see the, the heat map itself. Um, as, as I say, this will all be done frame by frame. Um, okay. <laughs> So 
all these different instruments, you see how it's vocalising them. Third example, we're going to change the modality now. So far we have audio and visual, now we're going to change to language or text and visual. So in terms of our infant, um, by about 10 or 12 months, infants can start to uh, understand words and speak words and you know, eventually they learn to read like this. And that's, that's what we're going to do now. And I've done it in this order. I've started with uh, vision and audio visual and then moved on to language because um, an infant learns to speak after it's learned to see. Okay, let's just go back to our cognitive psychologists. Um, they give six lessons, um, and lesson number six is learning language. So we're following their six lessons still. How to do it. So we've, we've seen that we, we can train networks like this I showed you in the audio case, where we have a visual encoder and an audio encoder, and then we um, have a, what's called a contrastive loss, so we minimise the distance when there's a correspondence between the outputs. And very simply, we can, if we're changing the audio modality, we can also just change this audio encoder to uh, a text encoder. So now we have text, which corresponds to the, the video. So the text here is a man is playing an electric guitar. Um, we have a text encoder, and we can use exactly the same idea, this correspondence idea that if this text description, um, the sentence, corresponds to this image, describes this image, then the output, these vectors should be close together, and if it doesn't describe this image, it describes some other image, then the output, these vectors, should be far apart, and that's it. So we, we've got our network, now how do we train it? So we need to, to train this, we need to have paired data between images and uh, text, so text which describes images. Where do we get that from? Unfortunately, there's, on, on the internet, there's something called alt text, which is uh, you, you hover your mouse over an image, you often see a sentence comes up, and it's, it's provided so that you don't have to download the image, or for the visually impaired, it can be read out. So this alt text is available at massive quantities. There are millions or billions of examples of alt text available. Now, I've put some examples on this slide. On, on the left-hand side, far left, um, the alt text is trees in, in a winter snowstorm, it's describing the image. And the one on the far right is a um, facade of an old shop. Okay? So this is available easily, and we can train this network by um, getting millions of examples of these, these, these paired uh, visual text, and as before, just taking positive ones where they correspond, distance should be small, and when they don't correspond, so we pick uh, a random image and a random text, they don't correspond, the distance should be large, and that's it. We train the network. Okay, so again, imagine we train the network and we look at the embedding space where these vectors live, then what we'll have is if the text corresponds to the image, as it does here, the embeddings will be close, and if we have another piece, another text, man playing the guitar sitting down, that doesn't describe this, this image on the left, so it will be far away, but it will be close to the, the actual image where a man is um, playing the guitar sitting down. We've got this embedding space again. Now, how do we use how, how do we use this? So we're going to use this for search and retrieval of images and videos using language. This is really useful. So, once again, um, we have a joint embedding space. We can populate this with images. So these these dots now represent images that have been encoded, the vectors from those. And say we want to find a particular image, and we want to find it using language. So we describe what we want. So here's a sentence, car in a river. We embed that in this space, and then we, again, all look for neighbours of this. So here's a neighbour. This will then correspond to an image of what we're looking for because of the way we've trained it. Okay. So now I'm going to show you a, a, a demonstration of this. Um, the, the, the really remarkable thing about language in terms of communicating with the machine is you, it's, you can keep on adding words in language. You can make queries even more complex. So you can keep on adding requirements. I'll show you 
how that works in the demo. So this will be a demo um, searching 35 million images from Wiki Wikimedia Commons. Okay. And you'll, you'll see the text being typed in and the retrieval will come immediately. And we'll start off with something quite simple. So the first one is a red car. And there we are. Now we make it slightly more nuanced. So it's now a sports car. And there it is. And now more interesting, several requirements. Person riding a bike. There we are. Change bike to horse. Fine. Now make it even more demanding. R riding a horse, but jumping. And there it is. And, and so on. And we can also search for animals, and we can uh, search for animals doing particular things, like you know, things, penguins raising their wings. Okay. And so it really is, what you're seeing here is, um, by this, this embedding, we really are, it feels like you're communicating with the machine, actually, because you get this instant response, and you can keep on making it more and more precise, the search query you're looking for. OK, so um, that's the, the three examples I wanted to show you of learning from data. Um, so that's sort of the tutorial part of the, the talk. Um, now I'm going to, to finish by giving you two snapshots of research, um, sort of more recent research, that build again on this type of self-supervised learning of correspondence between modalities. Okay. So we've done all this work, now let's, let's use it for some applications. So I'm going to do two applications. One is going to be recognising British Sign Language. And then I'm going to do audio description of videos. Okay. Number one, British Sign Language. So this is a, a visual language um, that the deaf community uses in Britain. And here's an example. I don't know how many of you can read British Sign Language. So I'll tell you what she was doing. She was interpreting the sentence, every spring our planet is transformed. Okay. I'm going to play it again. And... You can look for the um, sign for planet. Okay. There. Okay. But she actually does seven signs in that short sequence. Um, and it's very challenging to spot them all. How, we would like, of course, to have a machine that could understand um, British Sign Language um, for many reasons. One is so that then deaf people communicate with the machine. You know, at the moment... We can speak to, using Alexa, we can speak to machines and get them to do what we want. But um, if a, a deaf person wants to do that, they have to type it. It would be much better if they could use their own language to communicate. And of course, it would be very good if they could communicate with non-signers. You know, the machine could help do that, could translate. So that, that's why we want to do this. Um, how do we do it? Where do we get our data from? Where do we get our paired data from? And the answer is we get it by watching television. Because on television, you'll have seen signers overlaid um, with television programs like this and you have subtitles which correspond to what's being said and the signer is also interpreting what's being said so you have a, a paired data a correspondence between the subtitle and the sign sequence okay and this this correspondence is what we can learn from as we've been doing all the way through this talk now the bbc have very generously um made available 2000 sign language sign programs together with subtitles to support academic research on recognising British Sign Language. And I'm going to show you some work we've been doing on this large data set that they released. Um, and what I'm actually going to show you is, is how we can recognise signs or using mouthings. So, so what I mean by mouthings, when um, signers are signing, sometimes they mouth the words that they're, they're signing. Not always, but sometimes they do. That's what we pick up on. So I'll show you some examples. On the left, you're going to see a sign for office, um, but also he mouths office. Office. See. On the right, he's going to do the sign for tree, and he's going to mouth tree. Right. So why is this useful? It's useful because we can pick up words that are being uh, mouthed on the lips. We know how to do that. So how, how this is going to work is, imagine we have a subtitle, it's like this clip here, are you happy with the application? Now we can look for each word in this subtitle, happy application, and see if it's mouthed. And in this example, she does mouth happy. 
So we look at the lips and we find where happy is being mouthed. And once we've done that, we know the temporal segment where she mouthed happy. Then we know the sign, because we know exactly where she mouthed and we know the sign. So we have a way of automatically annotating the data and getting the signs. Okay? And the way we do the um, spotting on the lips, it, it uses this synchronization network I showed you in the first example. That's actually how we do it. Okay, so that was one example. Now imagine we, we, we do this at industrial scale. We scale up. We do it on the BBC 2000 programs. So we take the words that occur in the subtitles, we look at all the subtitles as they occur, and we see whether the person is mouthing that word, and then we take that segment, and that will be the, the sign corresponding to the word. I'll show you some examples. So first of all, for family. Go fast. Important. You see the word important. You see we're getting all these different examples. Before. So actually, if you look at this one, before is signed in two different ways in, in these examples. You can pick out some signs doing it one way, some signs doing it another way. Perfect. Now, we are getting these signs from mouthings, but of course, once we have the sign, we can recognize it just, we can learn to recognize it just from the hand movements, the hand gestures. Okay. So then we'll be able to recognize it whether they mouth or not. And we can generate, for each word, we can generate uh, thousands of examples, really, hundreds of thousands of examples here. You're seeing these perfect uh, examples we're, we're getting and more perfect. So it really is quite a perfect method, in fact, because we can generate signs for thousands of um, different words and hundreds of examples, say, for each one. And now we have a way where we can learn um, all these signs and recognize them by computer. Okay. But this problem is not solved, but this is a, a way of generating the data. Now, second application I want to show you, snapshot, is audio description of video. Audio description is a, a, a soundtrack that's provided for the visually impaired, and it describes the visual elements of, of the television program or the movie, okay, so that they can understand what's going on. Um, I'm going to show you a, a short example of audio description, this type of thing that's available. This is for the film Out of Sight. A man approaches toying with a lighter. She turns her head and finds Jack standing beside her. I buy a drink. Yeah, I'd love one. Sit down. He takes the seat opposite, then places his lighter on the table. She opens her mouth as if to speak, but no words come. So you see how the audio description is complementary to the soundtrack. So the things that you, you couldn't tell from what's being said or the music, that's what it's providing. And then someone who's, who's blind can understand what's going on in the film. Okay, so we'd like to be able to, to generate these automatically. So we'd like to have a, a machine that takes in the video and then produces the audio description, probably as text, and then we have a, a text-to-speech that will read it out so visually impaired can, can follow it. Okay. So how would we do that? So we obviously need to supply the video and to a model we're going to train and learn. But we have to do more than that, because audio descriptions have the names, you heard it, the names of the characters. So we also have to provide the names of the characters. We have to provide a character bank of the people who are in the film. So we need this auxiliary information. Now, given those two inputs, then we, we want to train a model to produce the audio description. Now, where are we going to get the trained data? And we need pair data between films and audio description. But fortunately, Volunteers have provided audio descriptions for thousands and thousands of films. So this paired data is readily available, and as you've seen, we can learn from these corresponding data. So we have films, we have the audio descriptions, we can learn a model which generates the audio descriptions. Okay, and I'm going to show you two examples of audio descriptions that we've generated. Again, this is, this is still work in progress, it's not finished. Um, they're both from Harry Potter, and the first one is a painful example. Concentrate, Potter. Focus. Okay, so that's, that's the clip. And this was the audio description that we predicted for that. So Snape correctly points at Harry. So we've got the characters right. Harry closes his eyes in horror. Okay, there's more pain, I'd say, but this is what's produced. Um, second example. It's a, a more pleasant example. So how are we going to get to London? We fly, of course. And the 
audio description that was produced was Hermione, Ron and Luna's eyes are fixed on Harry, who is standing in the doorway. That's correct, that's what happened. And then Harry rides on a horse's back as a horse rears up in the air. So this model doesn't think this is a horse, but of course it clearly is not if you know Harry Potter. But there's more to do here. Okay, so that's, that's the end of my snapshot. So I'm finishing now. This is what you've seen. You, you've seen that it's possible to learn visual encoders directly from data um, in various ways. There's no need for manual supervision, um, which is a traditional way of doing this. And I've gone through a learning curriculum for a virtual infant, infant audiovisual synchronization, audiovisual correspondence, and then language visual correspondence. That's what you've seen. I just mentioned that the field, computer vision field, works on this problem a lot. And even though I've shown cross-modal learning, you can also learn visual encoders purely from the visual stream. So, so deaf people can see as well, of course. Um, but I'd like to end by thanking people. So, the, of course, this work is not just not done by me by any means. It's done by um, my, my students, my postdocs, and I'm always inspired by talking to uh, faculty, um, Oxford in the UK, DeepMind internationally. It wouldn't be possible without all these people, and a lot of them are here in the audience. So that's great. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Andrew, for a super lecture, very stimulating. Uh, we have time for some questions, uh, so who would like to start us off? Now, there are a couple of people with microphones, so if you put your hand up, someone will come to you with a microphone. Uh, so let's start over here uh, on my right, your left, um, with the first question. We also have people, because of course it's been live streamed, so we have people who can ask questions on Slido, and I think one of my colleagues is hovering around with an iPad and will wave at me if we have some questions on Slido. Please, go ahead. Hi, thanks for lecture. Um, what I was going to say is how far are you away from um, having real-time live access to this, this system, if you like, really? Um, so there are lots of systems I showed here. Yeah. And the the real-time demo I was showing, that's, that's real-time. Okay. You know, um, so you can type it and it will immediately... Um, retrieve images or videos from a large data set. So. Right, I think what I was trying to say actually is more the uh, video. So at the moment it's trained on videos online, I take it. And um, what I was trying to say is that if you used to have a device that could um, see someone talking in real time, like for instance the um, sign language, could that be then translated? So sign language is not solved, just to be clear. We, haven't, you know, we, we can't do continuous sign language yet. And at the moment, most of these methods run on um, big machines, GPUs, yeah. et cetera. But there's, there's, uh, there's lots of work on taking these large, these big models and distilling them down to smaller models um, in, in, in various creative ways. Um, so even though it, at the moment they run on um, it, GPUs, et cetera, some of these models already can run in your browser. Uh, you can do real-time post detection of humans in your browser. Um, you can see that ASR, automatic speech recognition, can be done you know, in your browser. So th these models start large, but then um, once they're ready, they, they can be made you know, smaller and, and uh, more portable. Does okay. that answer your question? Yeah, that's basically it, really. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I wouldn't say all the models, though. I mean, some of the models are too large at the moment to do that, of course. But that's the way it goes. Yeah, I understand that. Thank you. Okay, the next question, just a few rows back, I think. Congratulations on the prize. <laughs> Thanks for the lecture. So it feels like for different tasks, maybe you have to do like a very specific data processing, right? Uh, which you explain now. Um, do you see a way of doing self-supervision um, with like a fairly general type of data processing where you can apply it later to very different tasks and like maybe like what ChatGPT does for texts? Thank you. So, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so I've, I've, I've concentrated on visual tasks here, um, but we already know the answer to that. The answer is yes, that I, um, I sh I've shown some different types of self-supervision here, and there are many others, as I said, and once networks uh, have been trained um, in some way uh, by these self-supervised methods, they then can be used for, for multiple tasks by applying what are called different heads, so they can be used for recognition, object detection, tracking, 
it's, 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 once you have a good features and good network, it can do multiple, multiple tasks. And this is really the way that um, large-scale networks are trained nowadays. But, but there's still an issue of you have to say what the tasks are. If we haven't get, it's still a research question to train the network and then it can immediately do all the tasks you want it to do, predict depth, predict other things about images or videos. It's, it, it's, there's still work to be done here, but we certainly have lots of evidence that training a good visual backbone enables lots of tasks after that. Okay, um, so I think we have, yes, a uh, question there. And if you go, yeah, one row back first, I think. Hi, I just wanted to ask, uh, how do you decide on how many dimensions the embedding space should be? Yes, it's, it, thank you. It's, it, it's usually a power of two. I, mean, I think it's a good question, <laughs> but it's not a good answer. It, it's, it, it, um, it's also storage. Um, you know, if the vectors are very large, it requires more storage. But no, I don't have a good answer. So it, it's an empirical question, really. You, 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 you try different um, size, sizes, uh, and you, you determine what works best empirically. But it, it's, thank you for asking, but I, 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 don't have, I don't know if anybody else here has got a better answer, but it's... it's Any volunteers now coming up? OK, go ahead, please. Thank you uh, very much for the talk, Andrew. Um, knowing what you know now about this research project, uh, which parts were the hardest? Right, was it data collection, data prep? Was it designing the encoder, neural net architecture? Like, what would you, for somebody else that's working on the similar research project, what advice, knowing what you know, would you give? Each stage of these projects, you stumble across something. You know, there's always a way of project. You have, you have an idea, or somebody has an idea, and you start doing it, and then unexpected things happen. So it's difficult to answer, really. Um, sometimes the networks are hard to train. Sometimes the, the data that you think is good is um, not good. And it's, w w when you have, you're putting together so many things like this, it, it, unexpected things happen. And you know, like one of my rules is um, it, when you have data sets, they're always noisy. I mean, it's, 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 it, it always happens. There's always something wrong. And you, you always have to... to look at your data and see what's going on. So I can't give you a definite answer, it's just that every stage always has problems. Okay, so there's a question at the front here, I think, yeah. Oh, thank, thank you for a, a great lecture. So with, with the, um, the, the first message you, you showed with, with temporal alignment and so on, and, and you argued that that could be how babies you know, might, might learn to to see as, as, as a cue, but with the, the later work, with, with things like you know, text to object, that, that still seems to require a huge amount of data. Is, is, is there any argument that that might, might be similar to what ways that babies learn to, to see and, and correspond with language? Yes, it's good to ask, Ellen. Um, I think the huge amount of data in the text case is, is yeah, it's an Achilles heel. That's a, that's a problem at the moment, that you need so much data to learn from. And I think it's a research question how you can avoid needing so much data. I mean, I was, by the way, I wasn't saying this is how ba babies necessarily learn. I mean, in principle, they can learn this way because we can see that just from the data you can learn these, these tasks, these skills. Not, not saying necessarily that they, they do this at all. It's just that the, the information is there. And the order is that after they've learned to see and hear it, it, cognitive um, development, we know that that's, it's later that they... Um, Acquire language. That, that's the only point I was making there. But mm. yeah, how, how to avoid having to use such vast quantities of data in, in the text case? I don't have a good answer to that. In the in the audio and visual case, it's readily available. It's, there's no cost to that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question here. I'll just keep your hand up, please. Yeah, let's wait till we can see. Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, I am not in the field, uh, so my question might be stupid, <laughs> but I'm just wondering, uh, for the correspondence or synchronization, uh, what if there's uh, some like false correspondence? Let's say I'm waving my hand, but this actually corresponds with the sound, which is not in the image at all. Will your model be able to pick out that? So, so it, 
it's the large data, large scale data that helps avoid problems like that. You, you, you always have, um, we can call it noise, you know, things which don't correspond f um, to what's making the sound. But when you see enough examples, you, you can pick out the ones that matter and the ones that don't. So that's, that's the answer to that question, really. Okay. In, in, it just if you think of the talking head, um, the, uh, there are lots of things going on. You know, the, the, the person when they're talking, their eyes might you know, flutter, their hair might blow in the wind. But to, in order for it to solve the task of learning synchronisation, it has to see that what really matters is the lips, because it's the lips that are synchronised with the voice, with the, the speech. So it, it gets to ignore all these, these nuisance factors, this, this sort of noise, and pick out what really matters, otherwise it can't solve the task. Sure, OK. So, an Andrew, how many is enough? Yeah, this is another <laughs> question. This is, this is a good question. in different circumstances, because yeah. not yes. the same in all circumstances. Yes, yes. It, it, it's another um, it's a question we always fight with. We, we keep on um, going empirically and, until we, we, things work well, and uh, then you see if you can, you can train more efficiently, meaning less data. But you know, so I'm, I'm waving my hands and saying a million samples. But, um, because that's typically what we use, but, and because it's so easy as well to get this data. And is there, is there a kind of statistical test you can apply the, 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 generically the, the, to these things? There, okay, so to give you a more proper answer to the scaling laws, what are called yes. scaling laws, where you can see, say for a number of parameters, um, how much data do you need mm. given a certain training budget, and is, it, is this published work for training models? But again, it starts off empirically. It's not, it's not like um, physics or geometry where you can give counting arguments. It, this, this isn't... This field doesn't have things like that. It's much more empirical, and then um, generalising from that. I think some more hands. So yes, uh, two over this side. Uh, this one first, I think. Uh, where's our person with the uh, microphone? Hi. Um, I have two questions, quick ones. Um, what do you think computer vision will look like in, say, 20 years? <laughs> and <laughs> and the second is um, is superhuman vision possible? Do, do you mind if I don't answer the first question? Because I, I think these sort of predictions, I, I, I know people always want to estimate the rally, but I, 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 you, you're always wrong. So whatever I say, it's going to it's going to be wrong, really. It's because it, it could move so quickly. Um, superhuman, yes. What what would what would be superhuman though? Because I think we. we for sure, we can do things that are superhuman. I mean, I, I'm being able to search through 35 million images in a fraction of a second, surely that's superhuman. And we're going to be able to, for sure, um, the search of enormous um, satellite images, you know, spanning the whole world, we'll be able to find something instantly. You know, we already can do superhuman things with computer vision, I think. And, and it will go on in terms of temporal, you know, um, you know, temporal resolution, um, spotting things which exist over long time scales that a human wouldn't notice, or a short time scale that a human wouldn't be able to see, or hear, or, you know. All of the things will happen, yes. Once we can do a skill on a computer, we can, we can make it superhuman. Okay, we have a question here. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, you showed us the multimodalities of examples, and then in the end you said that it also can be applied to the single modality, but with the single modality, obviously, then you have to figure out the augmentations because uh, it's less obvious how to compare positive and negative examples. Um, have you found that multi-model uh, um, embedding and comp comparing the embeddings from multiple modalities learns better because you don't have to engineer those augmentations? Or can you, uh, you know, uh, or do they perform on par, or do they a single modality can perform actually better? Yeah, this is, that's, that's a good question. Um, and you're right that uh, if you, with images you have to do augmentations, um, which may take, so just to, to be to control other people. With if you go into um, do self to from a single image, you know, you, the sort of things you might do is crop the image and. You want the embeddings to match, even though you've cropped. You know, so if an image has got a horse in it, and you crop out parts of it, it will still be a horse. So you, you want the embeddings computed from these various crops to all match. And that, that will then train the network to understand that the, the contents of the image shouldn't be affected by these crops. Um, but to answer your question empirically, uh, this learning from multimodality is 
generally um, works better than than certainly in video than um, doing all these augmentations. It, it's 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 all naturally doing augmentations. So so it's, it works better. But the other methods work very well as well. You just have to work harder to make them work. And some of the people in this room have have done uh, multimodal and um, unimodal learning. But uh, yes, it's just it, they all they all work well in the end. It's just you have to do more work to make the unimodal ones work. I'd say. Yes, we have a question here. Thank you for the lecture. Very interesting. Um, just because I'm curious, I suppose, on the, um, on the topic of solving for finding a speaker in a crowd, what if everyone is turned around? How do you then detect a speaker? Yes, it's, this is... This is um, then... Um, it, it, it can't answer, of course. It's, it has to see the lips. To, I mean, that's the answer. But there will be other cues. I mean, when, if a person's speaking, I'm not going to turn around, but you know, when I'm speaking, I'll move my hands. There's body language. There are other ways you can, you can do this as well. We haven't, I haven't shown that here, but you could imagine that if, you, if everybody was always speaking from behind, then the network had to solve the problem. We would do something like that. Thank you. OK, I think uh, the gentleman here will have the honour of the last question. Yeah, I was just wondering, in terms of, th th there were several examples where you had where the, for example, there's a visual network would be, um, you know, working together with maybe an audio network or it could be a uh, descriptive network. And I'm wondering whether the sort of embedded space that you end up for the visual network can apply across kind of multiple different Problems. I mean, you sort of alluded to that earlier, saying that sometimes it kind of actually, the, even if you trained it on one problem, then it can actually be useful on other problems. And I'm wondering whether these embedded spaces end up sort of encapsulating a, you know, a, a, an overall description of the image, which you know can can be used in multiple different tasks, and and whether that's those, uh, you know, Im embeddings are are kind of you know. Uh, a good gestalt of the of the whole uh, thing that's being presented. Yeah, the answer is yes. As I, I said, you, you're training them for one task, but in order to solve that task, they have to do something more than you've, tra you've trained them for. And I give the example of the, all the drums being embedded close together, all the guitars being close together. And once it's done that, then it, anything which is like a guitar or like a drum, it will, it will embed to a certain point. So it's, it's sort of learnt the characteristics, and that applies to thousands of different categories, and then you can use it for tracking guitars or um, other, other properties you might want for guitars. It's, this is, this is, the answer is yes, basically, yes. Okay, well that's super. Uh, now before you applaud to thank uh, Andrew again, I'm going to combine that task with presenting him with his scroll and medal. So Andrew, if you want to come out here, because it will make it easier. And thank you. Thank you all very much for coming. It was an excellent lecture. Thank you. Very much.